Hi. Uh, one of the areas that we need to be concerned with as we get older, whether it's for ourselves or for our loved ones, is what, what type of retirement care facility we might find ourselves in eventually. I know everybody wants to stay at home and age in place as long as possible, but the realities are that uh, many of us, the vast majority of us, are going to find ourselves in one type of facility or another. I'm, I'm on the learning, I'm on the beginning of that learning curve to make myself familiar with the different types of facilities and all the implications of, of uh, being a resident in these facilities. So what I wanted to do is to invite somebody I consider an expert on this, Scott Tenbrook. Scott is, uh, he, he owns Elder Options for You, which is here in the Charlotte area, it's sort of the Charlotte community. And uh, Scott, why don't, why don't I hand the ball over to you and, and tell us about your background and a little bit about what your services are for, uh, for families. Sure. Um, thank you for having me on. My name is Scott Tembrook. I'm the owner of Elder Options in Charlotte, North Carolina, and we are a geriatric consulting company. Uh, what that means is we help uh, <clears throat> older adults and their families find resources they need, um, whether it's in the Charlotte area or anywhere around the world. Um, we try to help them and not just help them find it, but also guide them through the process to make sure it's implemented in a way that meets their budget and their social needs. Um, so that can range from anything to finding a community, to finding uh, equipment, to a lawyer, doctor, uh, whatever it is. And uh, we're not just the referral agency guiding them. Uh, because we don't do referrals, we uh, are actually uh, walking them through the whole process from start to finish. And that finish could be at the end of their life. Um, my background is I uh, used to run nursing homes and assisted living homes for many years. I ran it in four different states. Um, I was also a inspector for um, assisted living homes within Mecklenburg County for five years under the uh, <clears throat> guardian ad litem, uh, sorry, guardian ad litem program was in South Carolina, and I was in, in the ombudsman program within uh, North Carolina, within Mecklenburg County, and uh, I, with the guardian ad litem program, I represented older adults who had an emergency situation and represented them in court alongside their attorney. Let, let's just start by giving a, a primer on what are the different ki types of facilities. You said you worked in uh, assisted care facilities and nursing homes. What do I need to know as far as what are the different types of facilities that are available? It's not a one size fits all. Sure. It is not. So in general, if I went across the country, it's broken down into basically four types of facilities. And those are independent living, assisted living, nursing home, and continuum care retirement communities. So I'll start from independent living. Independent living is basically an apartment complex um, that is for adults 55 and up that serves meals. Everything I'm saying, there's an exception to it. Um, but I'm saying in general, how are most of them structured? So they serve meals. They uh, provide activities, they provide housekeeping, and um, but the staff that is in independent living has no healthcare background or they d and they don't provide healthcare. So some of them might have a healthcare background, but they are not allowed to provide any type of healthcare. Um, they have contracts with home care companies or uh, agreements with home care companies who might rent office space from them or come in periodically, but they are not associated with the independent living facility, which as I said, is very similar to an apartment complex that serves meals. Um, assisted living is just what it sounds like. Somebody needs assistance with something. They are there to get assistance. So those assistance within the industry are called activities of daily living. Activities of daily living are bathing, dressing, medication management, um, ambulation, which means helping you walk or being by your side when you walk, helping you transfer, showers, toileting, incontinence care, any type of help with those, that is what an assisted living company does. And um, the regulations at each place are different. 
um, who regulates them and all of those things are different between, between these different levels. Then we go on to the next level, which is nursing home. Nursing home is um, the only one that is uh, federally regulated and federally mean by the, um, not just on a state level. And they uh, are exactly what it sounds like. If you're there, you need some type of nursing care in general, or you cannot do any of your activities of daily living. Again, there's exceptions to everything I'm saying. So what is an example of someone needing nursing care? They need an IV, they have a colonoscopy bag, they um, <clears throat> have a wound, they have something that only a licensed nurse is allowed to do. Doesn't mean that other people don't know how to do it, but within communities, a licensed nurse is only allowed to do. Uh, then you go to a continuum care retirement community. Continuum care retirement community is a combination of the last three things I've said. They have independent living, assisted living, and nursing home all on the same campus. Their model is structured that you start an independent living and work your way through. There are communities that allow you to come straight from home right into the assisted living or nursing home, but that is not their advertising, that is not their structure. And they do that because of how their budget is set out. So those are the basic four types of communities that are out there within any state within the country. And they function basically the same. They're gonna be regulated a little bit differently, but most of the regulations in general and are the same. I can give exceptions for different states just to show you some nuances, but um, it, in general, they're the same. So if you are a snowbird and you want to move to one state or the other and wondering how you're going to be treated differently, it'll be pretty much the same. Okay. So if if I'm in independent living, there's probability I'm going to reach a point where that facility is no longer the right facility for me and I have to move to maybe assisted or directly into a nursing home, correct? Uh, correct. So let's talk about that because we bring up the word that is unfortunate within our industry, but it's just reality, which is liability. Liability within different communities. So many times, this is a little bit cynical, but many times when people are transferring from one type from one level to another, it is not because, not as much because they have advanced, but because the community can no longer take care of them or they feel they are a risk to the community itself from a legal perspective. For example, if somebody is living in an independent living place, even though they have home care and they are wandering around um, and getting lost, that can be a liability. Same thing for an assisted living that does not have a locked memory care unit. No, no independent livings have locked memory care units. Assisted living and nursing homes do that, though most people refer to assisted living homes as locked memory care. Many people don't advance to nursing home um, unless they have one of those items that I mentioned uh, where a nurse would be needed. Uh, sometimes they do. I have a client who is in a nursing home who does not need a nurse directly, but cannot move without something called a Hoyer lift. Hoyer lift is some, a net that comes underneath you and literally lifts you up in the air. Mm -hmm. And and many assisted living homes don't do that because of staffing limitations. So in reality, you could stay in an independent living the rest of your life. You could stay in assisted living the rest of your life. There are many, many people who do that. Sometimes it's with the help of hospice, home care companies, a variety of different things. So it's not an automatic that you'll have to move, but you should, each family should probably put it as a what if or something that's a probability. I don't think it's a high probability but it's a probability. Okay. You mentioned memory care facilities. Those those you consider more of assisted living? Yes, those are, they used to be more split between assisted living homes and nursing homes. They've really morphed more just into assisted living homes. There are still nursing homes that have memory care units that are part of it. Often, if it is part of an assisted living home, it is a separate hall 
or it might even be a separate wing or a building. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's a standalone, that means it's a separate license. There is not, I don't think, it, if I don't, I, I don't consider memory care nursing homes as standalone buildings are usually just a wing. Um, but when you are in a standalone building, most of the people that are there, it's in a locked unit and they have wandering issues. There is something going on with them, wandering or dignity issues. For example, they might come out undressed and or in their pajamas, or they might decide it's time to walk out to walk to the store in their hometown, which is, you know, hundreds of miles away. Right. So that is why it is locked. That is the purpose of a memory care in general is to keep the person as safe as possible. Let's um, talk briefly about the different governing bodies and the licensing requirements that are involved. Uh, you, know, you, you can't just go out there and declare, OK, I'm going to have a retirement home facility when any of the, the independent living or any of the others that you name. I, I can't just go out and announce that I'm going to open a home like this, correct? Or am I wrong? Correct. Well, that's interesting because I do do consulting with people who actually think they can do that. So okay. uh, you are you are absolutely correct though. That is not something you can do. You have to get a license. I would like to mention one thing I just forgot was a fourth community, which is under the assisted living home. Uh, you can't do this with a nursing home, but under the assisted living, um, procedures model you can open an assisted living home in your home you can put it into a residential home we are in north carolina which allows six people in a home in south carolina they allow 11 people in a home but there are many many regulations regarding fire all different types of things and i've been approached by many people who think they can open one in their home to make extra money and when then when they learned about the regulations, they usually don't do it. Um, but that is called in, uh, in it's called community homes. It's called group homes. Often group homes are associated with people who uh, have special needs. But in some states, group homes are related to older adults. This is only a home that is for older adults. Um, it is not for special need mm -hmm. residents. So um, family care homes is, are what they are called in assisted in, in North Carolina. The regulations and the people who govern them, if you want to do that, often the first place you start is through the state. Um, that is your main governing body. Um, with nursing homes, and if someone is accepting Medicare, not uh, Medicaid, but Medicare, then they have to do a federal application too. Assisted living homes do not accept Medicare. Independent living homes do not accept Medicare. So your main governing body is the state. <clears> That's <throat> different departments uh, regarding coding for the actual building itself. Then you get into uh, the health department who is going to be looking at different things. So you're looking at many different departments within each state. And they're going to have different names within each state of where you go. South Carolina and North Carolina are going to not necessarily have the same department that you would go to. But there's application fees. There's It's a long, long process. And there's a lot of money you have to put down, too. Okay. All right. So once it's been established, uh, I have a note here. How do we monitor the standard of care? So... Where the governing bodies, there is a process by which they're doing reviews on a scheduled basis. How is that? How, how do we know that these these facilities are staying up to standard? So up to standard is going to depend on the facility. Let's start with independent living. Independent living is going to have the same standard as <clears throat> part of it is going to have the same standard as any type of um, apartment complex. That is going to be the governing body. Then you have another governing body that is Department of Health. And again, these differ from state to state that will control the 
so how the you know the help how the food is being served how people are in contact with each other so the state got very involved with independent living when we had covid so they were putting a lot of restrictions on independent living even though they weren't putting those same restrictions on apartment complexes because of who was living in the facility and um so sometimes when you hear well it's just like an apartment complex you know many independent living facilities had you couldn't come in um even just because of the regulations around it the assisted living is has uh, more restrictions around it they have <clears throat> often inspections that are just related for assisted living regulations um some states have independent living regulations that are checked on but related to assisted living they're going to be going right down the regulations all these regulations are public record um some are confusing some are just like they look um again it uh, varies by state and then nursing home is the same thing you're going to have regulations by the state and also you'll have federal regulations if you are accepting Medicare. Okay. We we were talking earlier, there was a, a facility here in the Charlotte area that was recently downgraded. Yep, that was that unfortunate. Was, yeah, and speaking with you earlier, and you can correct me if I misunderstood uh, what you were saying, but it seemed like the the uh, investigation that resulted in the downgrade was a result of complaints by family members of residents. Is that correct? Yes, that's where that was part. Uh, that was part of the process. I it based upon the news articles, based upon seeing it, they they went from a five star to a one star. The star rating is one through five, one being the worst, five being the best. My philosophy in general is if you have a one or a five, you deserve it. Anything in between, it can be subjective. Um, all since this particular place was a nursing home, all of the citations, everything can be viewed online to the public anywhere. It's under medicare.gov. It's right there. And um, assisted living homes can too, uh, some states are more easy to get the information, others are not. Uh, North Carolina is a lot more easier than South Carolina, but related to this particular community, um, I don't know the staff there and it's, uh, I think saying their name is more irrelevant to than knowing the procedure. What happened, what's the process? Because this happens unfortunately a lot. But it also goes the other way too. So everyone, it's on the news when someone goes from a five to a one. Well, no one mentions when it goes from a one to a five. That's never on the news. Right. So there's many, many communities that go from a one to a five because they get their act together. So what does getting your act together mean? And what is losing what you had? You had a good rating, what happened? Everyone thinks in the industry that it's money. I've got to redo my roof. I need to put on new paint. I've got to knock down this wall. That is false. I used to do auditing all over the country. You do not need to spend a lot of money. It is simply following a process. So with this particular facility, they had people that, this is all public record, that were lying on a bed that uh, with a deflated mattress. <clears throat> Why would they have an inflated mattress? Because they normally have wounds. So they're lying on a deflated mattress because the electricity went out. Well, there's a way to solve that. It's You could have a generator that feeds the whole place rather than just a few outlets, or you could simply just bring in a good mattress until your electricity comes back on again. That's one small thing. Marking down showers. When was somebody showered? There's a lot of different ways to solve this, and it, it's just a procedure. Every time you give somebody a shower, you mark down Mrs. Smith, check, shower, 6 p.m. That's it. If you see any skin issues, you mark it down. Then you notify your nurse. There's a process. It's just boom, ba boom, ba boom. And um, unfortunately, that's been a problem within the industry, not just within North Carolina, many, many, many states. If you went to any state, in the country and pulled up 
their citations, you would find somebody that has problems. So I always recommend for people to look at them, make sure you're understanding what the citations are, and you have to decide <clears throat> what is important to you and what's not. I'll give you an example of something that I ran a facility and I got a citation. I'll be honest about it. Um, we had somebody that uh, they didn't mark down when they got their uh, TB test. They didn't mark it correctly in the book for one of our staff members. So we got a citation for that. Does that hurt the staff? I mean, and other people, maybe. Um, I don't, uh, I, that's, up to, that's up to people to judge whether that's important for them. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. I'm just relating different types of things that you can get a citation for, including someone dying, someone not being bathed, maybe procedural paperwork for hiring staff. There's all different types of things and all of it is right there in public record. You can see it as plain as day. What can you offer any kind of commentary on what's going on with the hiring practices of uh, the different levels of, of care right now? It seems like it seems like there's a lot of turnover in every industry. I'm not trying to target the 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 um, retirement care uh, industry, but it seems like there's turnover everywhere. What so are in Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm just saying it's a concern because if I'm putting my loved one in, in at any one of these facilities, I don't want to see turnover. You know, right. I want to see continuity, knowing that there's someone there who knows my mother or my father, knows their nuances, knows how to what their medication schedule is, et cetera, et cetera. And that somebody isn't coming in new every month who has to relearn this and may not have the personality to fit my my relative. Right, so their care needs, um, the, I'll start with the problem. The problem is there's a tremendous amount of turnover within the industry. It's higher than, I mean, it's as high as fast food chains, it's higher. We're at 90% plus turnover for your basic care staff. Um, your administrators, are have high turnover rates your director of nursing's have high turnover rates um and i think it's important for people to understand the structure of a standard assisted living home or nursing home an administrator or a director of nursing those are your top two positions in general those are your top two positions within a community then you have maintenance director marketing director um but you've dropped salary dramatically um, between those. And then you go to your care staff. So your care staff includes all of the people on the floor who also do housekeeping at many locations. And then you have the kitchen staff who's making the meals. Sometimes those people alternate. Many times that's a separate staff. But that pay difference is dramatic. So sometimes they're getting, who, who's willing to work? Um, many staff members are leaving for 25 cents more an hour. So uh, I don't wanna go down too much of a tangent on the budgets within yeah. these communities, but the budget that you're given as an administrator has nothing, and I mean nothing to do with your revenue. It is simply, what is the least amount of effort we can provide to get the most profit? And these companies, because many of them are not mom and pop anymore, they're owned by large, large companies. Mm -hmm. They're making hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, I have seen many, many budgets of places that I've run and been at 99.5% full and still being told to cut my budget, even though I, I was within the budget to help a community that wasn't working. It is the craziest math I've ever seen. Um, I, If anyone wants to look at the stock portfolios of any of the major companies and then wonder why their places aren't painted with, you know, for a thousand dollars to get it painted, that'd be a great question to ask at the next uh, shareholders meeting. 
because <clears throat> I think this can this can be solved pretty easily. You just have to change your ratios a little bit, just barely, just a little bit. I'm a, I know how stocks work. I know how corporations work and I know how facilities work too. It's not rocket science. I just don't think it's that much. So uh, with that being said, when I started in the industry in about 2009, the average pay rate for a caregiver was $8 an hour. Now it's $14 an hour. So we're going in the right direction, but you're still having people jump ship to go work at Walmart for 50 cents more. So one of the things that people don't understand within facilities is what are you doing? I'm a caregiver. Or what am I doing? Why is there such a huge turnover rate? This is a very emotional industry. So if I worked at Walmart, I do not clean people's bottoms. Okay. I don't do that at Walmart. If I work at a fast food place, I do not feed somebody. I don't take and feed somebody and they spit it back up and I clean them. That's not what you do all day. Uh -huh. But I can assure you for the caregivers who work second shift and well, all shifts, quite honestly, that they are cleaning a lot of bottoms with a lot of different odors, with a lot of different stuff. I'm not trying to be crass. I'm trying to show the difference between why is there huge turnover rate within one industry as opposed to others. Often when you get citations, like what just happened in this example, they, they said the common thing that most facilities do, which I do not agree with, is they fire everybody. They will just clean sweep the board and then they will put that in their uh responding to the citation that this person was let go and this person was let go well they're just going to go to another facility why don't you train them better mm -hmm. you have a you have a systemic problem train them better it can be done and you just have to follow up on it and follow up on it and the corporations need to cut back on their paperwork that they're providing for silly things there's enough paperwork already there it can't these aren't all facilities there are facilities that work very very well because they do it well i did an audit at, audit one time for a <clears throat> community that was in chicago same community same size in fort lauderdale the one in chicago had been full for 10 years one in fort lauderdale was 60 percent i asked the person in chicago what's your secret you have a special program what's going on and he says we say hi to people when they walk in that's what we do we make sure the rooms are clean i'm like oh what else do you have do did you just buy a bunch of new equipment he goes nope that's it we just say hi and we make sure the rooms are clean and the other place, when I walked in there, there was two staff members. This was 9 a.m. in Fort Lauderdale. They were fighting in the hallway. They were having a fist fight. And they didn't know who I was. Really? Yeah. Wow. So um, it is, that shows me, and it's the same size facility, same year they were both built, same product they're offering. And one just did not get it. The other person, the administrator, I met him, calm as a cucumber, he got it. He got it. He has hard days and he has rough days, but he has a system that works. He had a system. And there are many, many, many places that work very well. They're not brought up much. It's brought up of the ones that stink. Mm -hmm. I, and I assume also there are some nonprofits out there. Nonprofits are interesting because... Um, the idea that they are doing something different than a for-profit, I know how nonprofits work. I understand the process. It is not that much different. It, you have a budget at the end of the day. <clears throat> uh, many of them advertise, well, we're going to give it a, your, if you run out of money, it will be free to stay here. That is uh, more the exception than the rule. So I, I would, when people hear the word nonprofit, um, I'm not sure the charity that's coming out of them, they have a budget and they actually sometimes even charge more than for profit. Mm -hmm. um, I think they're using the idea is that we get a tax write off or a 401c or something like that, that they are better or our hearts in the right place. I, I'm not sure about that. What I keep hearing is that at, it, it's really up to us as the family to monitor what's going on. It's not a set it and forget it scenario. 
We put our Correct. family members there and then we need to, hopefully we're visiting them and paying attention to what's going on. But it really is incumbent on us to manage the managers, I guess, is the best way to describe that uh, yeah. relationship. Uh, you know, I worked for one of the largest assisted living homes in the country. And um, I remember a conversation I had one time with their director of activities who was for the whole country. This is over thousands and thousands of communities. And he called me and he said, I heard you have a very large calendar in your assisted living home, which was a memory care place too. And it, it was, it filled up the whole wall. Mm -hmm. It filled up one whole wall. So um, I said, yes, we do have that. And he goes, uh, well, is that how a normal home would be like? And I said, no, it's not because they can't live in their home anymore and they can't see small print. So that's why we have that. And then I found out he had never been into a community before. He had been on one on their grand opening. And this is, this is a person who's in charge of activities for thousands of communities. Wow. So, so um, I want to make sure uh, that I'm describing, I, that was a situation where I just felt that there's a big difference between uh, the corporate and uh, what's actually happening in a community. Wow. Okay. Oh man, this so many this <laughs> so many questions. Uh, let's let's move on to this because I, I think I think a lot of people are running the assumption that well, when it's time for me to go to any of the facilities that you have described here, and that they can just show up on the doorstep and check in. That's not the case, right? Or you can correct me if I'm wrong, but. Isn't, so we need to do some advanced planning. Yeah, I think you uh, showing up on the doorstep just for simple scheduling isn't a good idea. You know, the first person you're going to meet at a community in general it, is the sales director or marketing director. And there's a lot of different names that are called at different places, but right. that's basically what they do. So they're trying to get you in the door, right? They're not going to lie to you. But their background in healthcare is probably pretty small. The background in sales is probably pretty big. So um, I always recommend for people to schedule a time to come in. Um, you can walk up to some places and they will do that to you. But I think you're kind of catching them in the middle of work. And mm -hmm. I, I often recommend to come in. When you were walking in, I recommend having a very brief conversation with the director of nursing. But... I also recommend do not describe too much about what your family member is doing. For example, if you walk into an assisted living home and say, oh, my mom was wandering in the uh, yard the other, or down at the neighbor's yard, and we had no idea where she was, they will not let you in. Mm -hmm. uh, every assisted living home and every nursing home is going to be doing an assessment of your loved one. That will be through doctor's notes, and that will be through laying eyes on them. You don't need to educate them. Let them do their job, because the things you will say are related to you emotionally, and mm -hmm. most people are not in my industry. You know, we, we have a small, we're looking for very specific things when you're doing an assessment. So let them do the assessment, and then they'll give you a yes or a no. Um, if it is a no, they might not even tell you why. They'll probably just say it's not a good fit. Um, walking into an independent living, the reason it's called an independent living because they're expecting you to be independent as much as possible. You don't want to walk in saying, I need so much help with my physical care needs. You can say I'm downsizing, but if you say I need a lot of help with physical care needs, I don't know if that's a good fit. Let's do the opposite. Let's go to nursing home. I'm, if you go walk in a nursing home and say, I'm just outgrowing my home, I'd like to come here and you have no skilled need, that's not a good fit. It's not a good fit. They offer too much for what you need. You need to start at a lower tier with the independent living, assisted living or memory care. So I always tell family members, you need to act a little bit dumber than you are. And I mean that kindly and politely, but don't fill in the gaps. Let the, let 
the facility, do the assessment. You don't have to spoon feed them. They do this every single day, every day. And so uh, you're just there to be a loved one. And if they have a very, very specific question for you, they'll ask you like, what do they like to eat? Things like that. Um, most facilities will not accept smokers. Uh, or if you do smoke, you have to go to an outside place. So if you're in the Northeast, that can be interesting during February because it's probably not covered. Mm -hmm. um, most uh, um, drinking, if you want to have alcohol and independent living, you can probably do that. And assisted living, you have to get a doctor's order for it. Um, I'm mad. I have to get a doctor's order to drink a beer? Yes, without a doubt. Right. I and need to assist my doctor. In assisted living, or and they will write down the amounts and the and the ounces, in many times. So uh, then the then you go into the idea of storage. Who's going to store that alcohol? Because you can't store it in your room. In fact, you can't store a lot of things in your room that you would be used to storing. I'll get an example would be like tums. You, in assisted living homes, you cannot store that in your room. That would have to be on the med card. If you had a medicated lotion, I don't mean prescription lotion, I mean a medicated lotion, um, you could not store that in your room. Wow. So there are other things that are very different. For example, fire alarms. You have to do a fire drill. In uh, certain states, it's quarterly. Other times, it's annual. But you have to get up from your bed and walk outside. That could be at two o'clock in the morning because you're supposed to do it once on every shift in certain states. Um, what else is different? Oh, two hour checks. A two hour check is, uh, so they're gonna come and check on you in your room in assisted living home and nursing homes every two hours. And they're doing that because that's part of the regulations. That is different than being in your home. If you had someone walk in your door, mm -hmm. they'll knock first, Ms. Smith, and they're supposed to wait until you say come in, but they don't in general because they have to check 40 people. At some point, we need to talk about staffing ratios too because of how many people are on a staff that are actually caring for people. Um, but your question about walking into, uh, walking up to a facility, maybe I would do a little bit of research first. We talked about some of what's their citation record um also what is their um how are they perceived in the community be, re be very careful with yelp and i'm not just picking on yelp but personal personal things on there that aren't state regulations here's why with the huge amount of turnover in the industry often staff members will write a bad review and make it sound like a family member or a family member will write a bad review and some of the family members, they're so invested in their loved ones that they can't see clearly on what's happening. I could explain it till I'm blue in the face, but I promised my loved one I'm never going to put them in a nursing home. Yeah. I promised, I promised, I promised I'm never going to put them in a nursing home. So what is the, uh, what options, you know, I just feel horrible. So since I feel horrible, I'm going to, uh, take it out on the staff. Um, that happens, unfortunately, more than uh, most companies would want, but it does happen. And there is a procedure and a way to do, do that. Um, that's why I often counsel family members that do you understand what's going to be happening? Do you get the process? What, what is this? And you know, you do have to be concerned about them, but at the same time, let the staff do their job. Um, there's something else for family members they need to be aware of, which is part of the regulations of assisted living home and nursing homes, which is FYI calls. F an FYI call is I'm Mrs. Smith, your husband, who is a resident here, just fell. I don't think he's hurt. We're sending him to the hospital. Well, is, why are you sending him to the hospital? because we found him laying on the ground and we don't know if he hit his head and we don't have any exam machines here. So I have to send him to the hospital. Does that mean the loved one needs to go to the hospital? Not necessarily. I don't think they have to go, 
for a two hour check, but that is up to them. If they wanna be there to hold their hand, great. But if they are there to offer clinical analysis, that should already be in the notes that are going with the EMT or the ambulance to the hospital. They are not there to fill in the doctor as much. It should be crystal clear within the notes. So those are some different things. If you're going to a community, what to expect? You know, we haven't even talked about costs, but before that we, is- Before yeah. we get to costs though, I, I, I want to circle back. With regards to getting into, we, we talked about some of the things you want to look at when you, you know, don't give, give too much information when you're talking to the uh, administration and the uh, admit, I'm gonna call them admissions staff. Uh, but how far in advance do you need to start this process? That, that's really what I was um, leaning towards yeah. because I, that's what I, I mean. You say, can't just assume that when I'm ready to, I, an event happened in my life and now I have to go to a uh, assisted living. Okay, I fell over my head, I need to go. That's what I meant. They're not just going to, and you can correct me, but they're not waiting for you to show up at their door so that no. they put you in. Right. So many, the goal is for every community to run full. That's their goal. They want to be a hundred percent full. They're not saving a room for you. Right. Every, every time they have an empty room, that's revenue lost. It's real simple. So um, you want to plan ahead. And sometimes that might be getting on their wait list. Sometimes you might have to put a down payment down. You'll get that back if you don't decide to choose that place, but you can put a down payment down. Mm -hmm. um, but planning ahead of time. So the problem, I'm going to talk about the advantage of planning and the disadvantage of planning. The advantage of planning is you get to see the layout. The layout's never going to change, right? That will never change. The rooms are in the same area. The dining's at this place. Right. The general meal will probably be the same. Um, uh, what to expect, uh, the, um, uh, location compared to other places within your town, that's never going to change. So we're talking a lot about facility location, the logistics of getting from point A to point B, getting to your doctor. If you decide to use a doctor outside the facility, things like that. Um, in a nursing home, you can't use a doctor outside the facility. I mean, I guess you could, but I would say 99% of the people use a doctor in the facility. Um, so the downside to visiting way ahead of time is, oh, I really like that nurse. I really like that administrator. Well, with our turnover rate, they might not be there. They could, they could, it could change. Um, what you're looking for is consistency. So it's nice to meet a staff member that's been there over five years. That's who you want to meet. That's the type of person you want to uh, engage with and talk to another resident or a family member. I, you're allowed to stop them. If they, you know, I, you just tell the salesperson, I'd like to talk to another resident. They're going to give you their best resident. It's going to be their favorite resident. But you should get an idea of different things that, might not change. Let's talk about odors. Okay. You walk into a community that has that treats incontinence, it's gonna have odors. There's a difference between a hallway having an odor versus an entire building having an odor. The entire building should not have an odor. If they're changing 10 people on a hallway, there's gonna be an odor. Mm -hmm. It's just gonna happen. But they should get the once it is changed, I should get that out of the building. It doesn't stay till the end of the shift. It should go right out of the building um, because otherwise it causes odors. So um, uh, people sometimes say, well, someone's just sitting in the hallway. I would want to know a little bit more about that. You know, why aren't they engaged in activities? But who is engaging them in activities? You have one activity director. So for the whole building. So that activity director needs to be hiring volunteers. Hiring is volunteer and hiring sound like they contradict each other, but they should be bringing on a large volunteer program. In this community I worked in in Indiana, they had a, a hundred volunteers. It was right around there, right around a hundred volunteers. And I've worked at other places, they had no volunteers. I mean, so it, that is a process. It doesn't happen overnight, but that's how you go from one staff member trying to help 
100 people versus delegating it to many people through a volunteer program. So it, you're, maybe we talk about your experience as an administrator in answering this question, but somebody comes, what, what's, what's the normal wait time to get into a facility? If there is a normal and- Sometimes it's immediate. I was just at one yesterday where they had some openings in an independent living. Okay. Um, I was also at one that was building they're in the process of building, and so they won't be ready for the first person until May. I've been at others that they have a wait list that is years long okay. or months months long. So if it's years long, I would just scratch that off my list. I, I wouldn't even look at them. Mm -hmm. um, I, it's pointless. So how do they maintain places that are full? But this often gets asked, how do they maintain it? Because people pass away. So what they do is they take them from the hospital into their community rather than from the house into the community. Those are two different ways. Those are the basic two ways that people enter into facilities, directly from the hospital or directly from their home. Nursing homes in general, and again, as I'm saying this many times, there's exceptions to every rule, in general, do not often take people directly from their home. Assisted living homes do. Nursing homes often take people directly from the hospital and then they will just move through the system from the rehab department into long-term care, staying there potentially the rest of their life. Okay. So I get the answer to my question is when you should, how, what the weight might be is really, it depends. It really depends, it depends. on the it really depends. Depends on the community. Depends on. Um, uh, it depends on the market. If we're in, uh, we're a small town where you've got one community. That's what you're working with. In Charlotte, my numbers are a little bit off here, but I'm pretty close. Um, about sixty assisted living homes. I'm doing a big circle around Charlotte. Yeah, 20, right. 26 nursing homes, ballpark. I, you know, we're talking about communities a lot, but the other option before you get in there, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Home care. Get, mm -hmm. it, get help at your home. You don't have to get it 24 hours. You don't need it if you don't right. need it. But there's 300, approximately 300 different home care companies in the greater Charlotte area. Um, and the... But th there's a lot. <laughs> home care companies are everywhere. Yeah. Assisted living homes are a little bit more, and nursing homes there's even less. Okay. All right. A um, couple more things, and then we should probably wrap this up. This has been great, though. I, I'm, but uh, I'll, what I'll probably do is split this into two two sessions. Is sure. great information, but it might be hard to absorb unless you have a really good attention span. <laughs> Yeah, I, th I, I think if people were listening to this and they're like, wow, I'm pretty overwhelmed. Like, I don't know what to do. What I'm trying to tell you is don't just go out there and throw darts at the board mm -hmm. and, and then see what sticks. You have to know what your loved one needs. Do they need assisted living or nursing home? If they do need assisted living, do they need memory care? Mom got a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. Oh, we have to put her in memory care. Maybe. It depends. I know people that have had Alzheimer's for 10 years and they haven't advanced. I know other people that advance very quickly. What are they doing? Most of the time, a memory care appropriate is the things I mentioned before. They are wandering or is a dignity issue where they are not doing appropriate things that can increase communication and have communication within a normal assisted living. All right, let's, let's talk about the staffing ratios real fast and then We'll end it on a happy note, which is talking about the cost of this, but let's talk about oh, the staffing yeah. ratios first. So the staffing ratios are going to vary again from state to state. Um, I'm going to give you in general. And uh, first, I'm going to start off with the staffing ratios are set by the state. That You have to have those staffing ratios, have to have them. It's a regulation. People interpret regulation and law. Uh, and they use them in the same sentence, they are regulations and laws are two separate things. So regulation is mandated, it, it, you have to do it. I can't go to jail if I break a regulation. 
So that's a, it's not a, it can turn into a criminal thing if there was abuse, which would also violate a criminal procedure and a regulation procedure. But I want to make sure laws versus regulations, because uh, sometimes I hear those used in the same sense and they shouldn't be. Um, so staffing ratio goes in general, in general, you're, you're looking about, you're looking about one to eight um, for daytime and um, you're looking about um, one to 20 for now, probably one to 15 for second shift and maybe one to 30. And I've even seen one to 40 on third shift. The shifts run seven to three, three to 11, 11 to seven. Again, those vary from state to state because they might not consider that the staffing within that state has three shifts. They could have two shifts. Um, there are some odd regulations regarding staffing. For instance, in North Carolina, I think I'm saying this right, is you're allowed to sleep on your shift. So that sounds crazy when I say that out loud. I'm allowed to sleep on yeah. my shift. Yeah, right. But if I'm in a, a community home within somebody's home, you might have one person working one to six ratio right? One person. So they are allowed to go to sleep. Now, if you have a policy, which is written by your company that says you can't sleep and it supersedes, then it supersedes the state regulations. The state regulation, you can't have a policy that is less than the state regulations, yeah. but you can have a policy that is more than state regulations. So those are the staffing regulations in general. Within independent living, I don't think there are staffing regulations because it's basically an apartment complex and they don't provide care. So anytime we're talking about staffing regulations in general, you're talking about the care staff, the administrator, the director of nursing, the, uh, I believe the activities director in some states, and that's, pretty much it on who is required to be there for a certain amount of hours. Um, with dining, you don't have to do that. Some people cater dining in or they have an outside company do it. Um, actually, that's being done with assisted living home staff now too for the care staff. But ha I would like when people think about one to 30, a one to 30 ratio, that's one caregiver for 30 people within a third shift if that shift stops at 7 a.m. and they start getting people up for breakfast, which is at 8 a.m., right? It's at 8 a.m. How are you going to get 30 people up and dressed and ready for breakfast? It has to start on third shift, not first shift to coming in at 7. So when do they start it? At some places, they will start at 5 a.m. Wow. or 4 a.m. And so that is a question to ask. When do you start getting people ready? for your uh, for your meals? When do you start putting people to bed, helping them getting ready for bed? Are we getting them ready for bed right after dinner? Like immediately, oh, let's put on pajamas. You gotta talk about that, those types of things. If a facility ever comes to you and you're on a staff, if you're on a tour and they say to you, uh, and you ask them what their staffing ratios are and they say, we meet the state requirements, that's the same as me saying I've never been arrested. So that, means I, because if I said to somebody, I've never been arrested, then I, I think they would say, well, I'm glad you haven't been arrested. You shouldn't brag about that. <laughs> so that's the staffing ratios. If I say I'm meeting the state regulations, it, the answer is, so you're meeting what's already required for you that is required by the state and you're bragging that you meet the minimum regulations. I think there, we can do better. And there are communities that do better. And they don't brag about that they are meeting the rules. You should already be meeting the rules. That is your job. But part of managing the managers is the reality that, okay, if my loved one is in one, one of these facilities, they may have had these high staffing ratios. But then because of circumstances like COVID or changes within the you know, hiring practices, that has come down or gone sure. up. I guess I should say gone up. You, you have... Yep more residents per caregiver in those uh, situations. So it really is incumbent on us to stay up to date on what's going on in, within these facilities. That's right. And having the staff work smart. It's not just running. Oh, if I have 15 staff members on first 
shift or if I have a one to six ratio, I could still have a poor rating if I'm not doing it correctly. Right. I could have the minimum standards. I've seen people do the minimum standards and they have excellent, excellent care because they are working it correctly. They are following the right process and they are not just running. It run, 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 run. They shouldn't, that is not how a community should work. And that is a top down issue. That is not a caregiver issue that should be written. That should have, that procedure is by the director of nursing, by the administrator. Those are the people who should do it. Okay. <clears throat> let's, let's go ahead and move on to that happy question of what are we talking about cost wise with these different sure. types of facilities? So, in general, uh, uh, I'll talk about what will stay within the three structures, memory care excluded. Uh, I'll talk about memory care a little bit. Independent living, you're probably going to have a flat rate. <clears throat> You'll just have a flat rate that includes everything. Um, somewhere at anywhere from 2,900 to 6,000, depending on the community, uh, how fancy they are, what they offer. Most of them offer at least one meal. And then the other ones are a la carte, if you want, or some offer all three meals. Mm -hmm. uh, transportation, the variety of things they offer. Assisted living, two different cost structures. One, what is room and board? And then what is care on top of that? Some are, everything's included. So if I included everything, in general, the average cost outside of New York, Chicago, San Francisco, the big cities, is probably around six thousand. Uh, around six thousand a month. I know there are ten thousand places, and I also know that there are four thousand places. But I think I feel comfortable with the average cost of assisted living in the United States, somewhere outside of the big expensive cities, somewhere in the neighborhood of about six thousand. Mm -hmm. um, uh, again, I have family members in the Northeast who said it's way more expensive up here. I understand. I'm giving you an overall. Nursing home, you're looking at uh, same, uh, you're looking about 9,000, 9,000 a month. Uh, there's a place here in South Carolina, it's at 12,000. And there's also a place that is around eight that I know. Um, huge difference in quality huge, huge difference in quality. Um, but just keep those numbers in mind. Memory care is somewhere around seven to 8,000 a month. So that's monthly. Insurance does not pay for independent living. Insurance does not pay for ass assisted living. Long-term care insurance pays for assisted living and long-term care insurance pays for nursing home. Um, <clears throat> your healthcare insurance does not pay for nursing home either. It will pay for rehab within a nursing home but that is only for a very limited amount of time. The average stay is about 12 days. But anything beyond that, in general, once you are outside of your rehab, uh, you're looking at somewhere between 350 to 400 a day, which should fall 300 to 400 a day, which should fall right within the 9,000 to 12,000 range. Okay. All right, that is a lot of information to digest. It is one step at a time. Yeah, I just want people to feel comfortable that they're not running. I just don't want them to run in circles, run in circles, and not and try to understand the language and try to all run all this. Once yeah. your loved ones in a community, let the facility do their job. You can still check up on them, but I don't want you to try to learn a new language. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Well, you obviously know your stuff and I know we're just hitting the the top of what you do. I mean, this this is just commentary on on, on these topics that I've asked you to, to share. But I know you do a lot of things and, and uh, I would direct anyone listening to this. Ex well, you work all around the country, but you're yeah. you are here in Charlotte. But anybody who wants to learn more about what you do and how you can be an advocate for their families, because I, I know that you're big on advocacy for I Family. I am. So, yeah, advocacy is often misinterpreted as we're fighting, <laughs> and that is not uh, how I view advocacy. I view advocacy as the same as education. We're educating. Okay. We're educating the process. Good. So I, I'm not, uh, I or, or any advocate is not there to come in with guns blazing. 
That's the wrong way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, you should come in. There is no coming in. I'm, I'm going to tell them a thing or two. That's not what we do. And that's not what I think advocates in general do. They hopefully are educating you on what the process is like. Tell me what's going on. Tell me what's happening. Let me try to find a solution. And some of that might just be simply through educating the family member that, unfortunately, I know that sounds rough, but it is what it is. You know, yeah. I don't want anyone coming in and uh, feeding. I, my loved one wants to eat dinner at 10 p.m. at night within a nursing home. Well, that could be tough to do. So unless you're bringing it in yourself, it is what it is. Right. And. Uh, maybe that's a bad example, but I'm trying to say there are regulations for a reason, and there's a short amount of staff caring for a lot of people. So just think about it before you move in. Think about home care. Think about all the options that are available to you before you just run into a community. And hopefully the information you've shared with me, with me and anybody watching this video moving forward uh, will help prepare them. If they've got more questions, obviously they can reach out to you. Uh, if there's something that I can help them with on a more much more superficial level, uh, perhaps understanding how you're going to pay for these these resources, uh, I encourage people to reach out to me also. So, Scott, let's leave it there. And um, thank you again. I, I really appreciate the information that you've been sharing with us tonight. So. Well, thank you. I appreciate you having me on and uh, look forward to uh, anyone that wants to talk or having more discussions on this subject via Zoom.